All right, so in this video, we're going to talk about Hardy-Weinberg theory and how it relates to our modern understanding of evolution. The purpose of Hardy-Weinberg is to be a mathematical model of evolution. Um, it was created by Hardy and Weinberg independently. And, and ultimately, what we'll see is that when we apply the mathematics, it can help us tell a lot about the genetics of a population without having to actually like genetically test every individual in the population. So um, what is Hardy-Weinberg um, uh, equilibrium? It's, it's sort of um, what we consider like a null model of evolution. Um, Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium exists when evolution is not occurring. Or if we say that no evolutionary force is present and acting on the population, then the allele frequency should not be changing from whatever they are over generations. So make sure you're clear that Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is not when the two allele frequencies are equal. We're not saying that, that capital R and lowercase r have to be 50-50. We're just saying that whatever they are, let's say it's 30-70, a population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium if it stays that way over generations. So, um, you know, one comparison I would make would be to physics. I would say that physics tells us that in the absence of a net force, a, a mass will not change its motion at all. And so similarly here in biology, we're saying that in the absence of an evolutionary force, the allele frequencies will not change over generations. So um, really what we're saying here is that sexual reproduction itself is not an evolutionary force. It was not one of the five that I discussed in my last video. Um, sexual reproduction can play a, a very important role in changing the possible alleles an individual might get, but it does not change the overall population genetics. Um, a useful metaphor here might also be to think about a deck of playing cards that your book talks about. Uh, shuffling the deck of cards often is useful for creating a lot of variety in terms of individual hands of cards that you might get in a card game. But shuffling the deck does not change the composition of the overall deck. There's still 13 of each suit and say four tens or something like that. Okay, so let's think about what it would take for, for there to actually be Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Um, in some cases, when we sort of posit um, um, that this evolutionary force is not present, we just want to think about what it would take for that to be the case. So sometimes um, when we say, you know, what happens when natural selection is not present, you can actually phrase that as no natural selection. I think it would be better if you just sort of said that um, there would be no natural selection if all organisms were reproducing about e the same number of offspring. Um, if all phenotypes were surviving and reproducing equally, then there would be no natural selection. Um, similarly, what is sort of um, what would be happening if there were no sexual selection? Um, sometimes the way we put it is random mating. If if organisms are essentially choosing mates somewhat randomly and not being selective of a certain um, organism of a certain phenotype, um, then there would be no sexual selection acting on the population. Uh, what happens if there's no gene flow? We would say that there would be no gene flow if there were no organisms either leaving the population or coming in from a different area. Um, in order for there to be no genetic drift, um, there has to be um, some kind of condition to where randomness would not be playing a role. And there would be no randomness exerting a role if the population were very large, is the way sometimes biology books put it, um, and sort of theoretically, if the population were infinitely large, um, then randomness would play no role at all. Uh, and then finally, mutation. Um, what would be true if mutation were not playing a role? Um, simply, if there were no mutations occurring, then there would be no new alleles coming in to potentially change the gene pool. So uh, with some of those requirements, you might be thinking, so why is this useful again? Because it seems like that would be impossible for any population, for there never to be mutation, um, and for certainly for a population to be infinite in size. So it really is kind of an ideal model, no doubt. Um, but sometimes real populations get close enough to those requirements that we can sort of say that a, that a population approximates Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Um, similarly, uh, we, we do this all the time in science. Um, uh, one example would be the ideal gas law in chemistry. Real gases don't really match up with an ideal gas um, requirements um, uh, really any time, but at, at, at certain temperatures and pressures, real gases behave enough like ideal gases that we can still do some useful work with them mathematically. And that's what we're going to do here.
We're going to say that if a population approximates Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, then um, we can apply some useful equations to figure out properties of their genetics. And so we're going to use these two equations. These two equations are given in your equation sheet, so there's no need to memorize them. Um, but what's most important is you sort of appreciate what the terms mean. So let's break it apart a little bit. We have two equations. Um, I like to think of the top equation as like the allele equation. Um, so th that's giving information about the, the individual alleles themselves, whereas the bottom equation is giving us information about the organisms in the population. Um, and so let's break, up, break them apart bit by bit. Uh, P we are using to represent the percent of all of the alleles that are dominant. So, you know, uh, if we were just to analyze the letters, not the organisms, how many letters would be capital um, in the overall gene pool? And again, these are percents or frequencies. Um, Q would represent the percent or frequency of recessive alleles. You will find that in this mathematics, we often use, we always use decimals. Um, so that's why they have to add up to be one. And really what one means is 100% if you multiply by 100. So for example, if 40% of the alleles were dominant alleles, we would say that P would be equal to 0 0.4. Okay, um, so we can also um, apply this to organisms in the population. If an organism is P squared, what that term really means is that that organism has two dominant alleles, P, P would be P squared. And so what that really represents is what percent of all the organisms are homozygous dominant in genotype. P and Q means that you have one of each allele, dominant and recessive. So that whole term represents the percent of organisms that are heterozygous um, because you could either have dominant recessive or recessive dominant. That's why we kind of consider it like two because you could be either way. Um, sometimes students get confused and they think they have to divide by two to get the final answer there, but you don't. The entire term 2PQ represents the percent of heterozygous organisms. And Q squared represents the percent of homozygous recessive organisms. Q, Q, recessive, recessive. And again, because you have to be one of those three genotypes in very simple Mendelian genetics, that has to add up to be 100% as well. One thing I will also say is that oftentimes we can't see genotypes directly. We only see phenotypes. So we can also put this bottom equation phenotypically by thinking about it this way. Remember that there's two ways you can show having the dominant phenotype. So if we just see that 60% of the organisms show the dominant phenotype, that would be like P squared plus 2PQ equals 0.6 because you could either be dominant being homozygous dominant or heterozygous. Um, however, Q squared is still by itself because the only way you'd show having the recessive phenotype is being Q squared. All right, so let's maybe apply these equations and this will make a bit more sense as to how it's useful. Um, what if I had a population of mice? Let's say that there's just um, uh, one gene I'm looking at, two uh, different phenotypes. Uh, let's say that black fur is dominant over sandy colored fur. And you can see that this is just yet another example I'm showing you here where it just so happens that the recessive phenotype is more widespread. So if I counted all those up, I'd see that 70% of my organisms are sandy color and fur. So I know that Q squared, remember these are organisms, not alleles, so Q squared is equal to 0 0.7. And that must mean that the remaining organisms show the dominant phenotype, and that must mean that P squared plus 2PQ, I don't know if those organisms are homozygous dominant or heterozygous. All I know is that, that the, the two added up must um, sum to equal 0.3. All right, so what can I do with this, these numbers if I assume this population is close to Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium? Well, I really can't do that much with the equation on the left because with two unknown terms, I can't solve for one of them by themselves. So you will see that Hardy-Weinberg um, problems almost always start with trying to get to Q squared because you can easily just square root Q squared and get Q. So if I square root 0 0.70, make sure you put that in your calculator and you see that it's actually um, a larger number, 0.84, that tells me that 84% of all of the alleles in the gene pool are recessive. 
Okay, well, now that I have Q, I can just use that first equation. Um, P and Q have to add up to be 1. So if I know that Q is 0 0.84, that must mean that P is 0 0.16. 16% of the alleles in the gene pool are dominant. Now I can figure out more specifically how many of the organisms must be homozygous dominant by just squaring P. The square of 0 0.16 is about 0 0.03. And I can also figure out how many of the organisms are heterozygous in genotype by doing 2PQ. 2 times 0 0.16 times 0 0.84 is about 0 0.27. So with just a little bit of information, I just looked at their phenotypes. I can figure out a lot of information about their genetics by utilizing these equations. So all I did on this slide is I took the old phenotype pictures and I kind of replaced them with genotypes. Um, now we can see where we get information like this. We can't see genotype directly, but we can use Hardy-Weinberg mathematics to estimate this. And so once again, um, the, the key bit of information that I got first was how many of them showed the recessive phenotype, because that must be how many organisms are homozygous recessive, Q squared. Then I was able to square root that and figure out all of the, um, how, what percent of all the alleles are recessive. Notice that Q is bigger than Q squared. Why? Because Q squared represents just organisms that are homozygous recessive, but notice where else the recessive allele can be. It can also be hidden in heterozygotes. So that's why it's a little bit bigger. I could then figure out P, or the overall percentage of dominant alleles. Notice again that this does not refer to organisms. This refers just to the dominant alleles, or the letters themselves. And then I could use that information to figure out P squared, that is the percentage of a certain type of organism, homozygous dominant, and heterozygotes 2PQ. All right, so we just tried to um, quickly in this video define Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, define the terms of the two equations. We talked about um, what the requirements were for a population to be in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, um, and then we tried to explain why these equations are useful.